Hey, you've just entered the, uh, the law offices of Quibble Squabble and Bicker. If you've come for actual legal advice, you need to turn right around, honey. You need to get out of here, because you ain't going to get none of that. They quibble, and they squabble, and they bicker. But if you want to hear meaningless opinions, this is the right place. They got plenty of that. Stuff that makes no sense at all. They go off on tangents. It's crazy talk. If that's your thing, keep listening. They'll keep talking. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. It's another episode of the Law Offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker. You've entered the Law Offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker. Yay! Welcome to another edition of the Law Offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker. And today we have... If there's anybody who's going to be labeled a legend in their career, this is a gentleman who, if we can call him gentleman, I don't know if that's okay to do these days, but Absolutely. who has who's reached uh, the pinnacle of his career. Um, you really can't get any farther than where he's gone. Uh, his name is Bruce Valanche, and he's written um, comedy for the Oscars for approximately 532 years. He also has won numerous <laughs> enemies, Emmys, not enemies. Well, you might have a few of those. Enemies. <laughs> and had or two along the way and uh he's been on the hollywood squares wrote for the hollywood squares there, there's there's more we'll touch on as we go on don't forget also, donnie and marie right he he was once donnie and marie at the same time and we'll Ooh. also <laughs> will also help us later on to uh, tackle our new client when words collide all right so bring us to Mr. Bruce Valanche, this is totally a treat to have you on here. Thank you. I have a brand new smile. These are temporary teeth. Temporary I'm teeth. I'm an implant victim. Help me. It's, they're temp, so they're going to be like asking for it them back. Like, this is not my smile, but you know, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> right Along now, with, it I'm is your smile, that. whether you want it or not. Now, no, no, I'm speaking like Daffy Duck. It's just. This is, <laughs> Now, has the smile stayed in place since the Star Wars holiday special that you wrote? Oh, well, otherwise I'd be dead. You know, I mean, Star Wars holiday special is a work of rare genius. We could ask you a specific question about that. Did the writers who wrote that want to imply that Chewbacca's father was masturbating to that woman dancing in that scene? Because me and my friends all thought he was getting off on that. Yeah, he was getting... uh, we, we all thought that. But uh, okay. course, we couldn't pick it out loud because we had the network censor. And we we were assumed that the network censor would, would uh, jump on all over the thing. But, you know, it's a Wookiee. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a monkey in the zoo, kind of, in, a, in, a, in an unflattering comparison. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it is what it is. And so uh, we couldn't... I mean, people say to me, well, you know... Uh, uh, Harvey Corman in that show was in, with blackface. I said, he didn't do blackface. What are you talking about? Well, when he was doing the, the, the cook, the chef, uh, Julia Child, that was, I said, first of all, that was, uh, he wasn't blackface. It was green. And you saw it on your set as black. <laughs> and secondly, uh, if he was an alien from outer space. Plus, I didn't know Julia Child was, was a human an alien. Being. That's not intergalactically correct. I mean, you can't believe over uh, 45 years the amount of comments I have been pilloried with about that show. <laughs> I mean, questions and stuff like that. So if you want to talk about it, I'm, I'm delighted to talk about it. <laughs> except, except people get pissed off because I always have to point out at the beginning that um, a lot of people, it was right after, the year and a half after the Star Wars movie came out. It was right before George started doing The Empire. And there had been one movie, and a lot of people thought that was a piece of shit. They thought it was a silly, a stupid summer movie that was like a ripoff of a Republic Studios serial of their, of their childhood. And it had not yet become the Scientology of the nerds, <laughs> which it became after three movies and many decades and many generations coming up watching the things on VHS and then... DVD, and then streaming it, and then a whole other raft of movies that he made. So it had become a religion to some people. And when they discovered this, this you know, piece of absolute kryptonite uh, on their, vid on their uh, computers, I said, George, what the fuck is this? You betrayed <laughs> us. How could you? And they, they got, you know, they got really genuinely mad. And they, they came after us. They, they came after George. I know he had death threats. It was really... It was kind of amazing. 
So, you know, it was, it was like every other TV special in 1977. We were all chemically altered. And they, <laughs> they put on these ridiculous shows. I mean, Connie Stevens and, uh, sings Cole Porter. Really? <laughs> Yeah, those are, those of you paying attention, hopefully you know who Connie Stevens is. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm dropping references from 1977, and this is all before all of you were born. So. Well, yeah, I wish. Well, yeah. <laughs> I wish it was before I was born. I wasn't an old man, but I was alive. And yeah, I saw that special when it came out. I think I was 11. Uh, all right. I, I probably you were the you were the target market. No, we know who so, Connie Stevens is. We're just talking to, to whoever watches our show. Joey, no, I'll be honest. Mother, Bruce, even at eleven years old, I thought it was crap. That's special. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, first of all, you probably had seen the movie and loved it if you were eleven. Yeah. And so you immediately noticed how stupid it was compared to the movie and how cheap looking the sets were, mm -hmm. and how Mark Hamill looked like he had gone to some gay bar for makeup lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was the strangest thing. Uh, but, and, you know, George handed us this story, and I don't think, uh, first of all, I don't think, George had 10 Star Wars stories in his pocket, and he just said he was going to make six movies, and the others he sold off, and he sold this one off as a promotional tool to keep stirring the pot between Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, and the, it was the last one he had, and he, he sold it to CBS as an original musical. Now, I think if he really was expecting CBS to do an original musical, he would not have sold them a story in which the lead characters speak no known language and all sound like fat people having orgasms. When they, <laughs> trust me. They could have sung Surfing Bird. <laughs> you what? They could have sung Surfing Bird, maybe. Just like, <laughs> rah, 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 rah. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a fun minute. <laughs> all the Wookiees is doing back, back then so everything uh, had to be explained to so the, the what the Wookiees were doing had to be explained because they're also cumbersome creatures they're not great at mime so <laughs> they had to be other characters had to come in and explain and they had to talk to the Wookiees and they had the Wookiees needed subtitles but CBS wouldn't let us use them but you could have put the Wookiees in blackface, reading. though. You could have gotten away with that with the Wookiees. It didn't even occur to us. Oh, okay. They are, they are from another planet. You should make them into mimes. I, I would say put Wookiees in, like, Marcel Marceau costumes. Uh, no, you're you're barking up the wrong Wookiee tree. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were dealing with George Lucas here. You were dealing with oh. one, of the, one of the latter day Puritans. <laughs> Yeah, this was this was what he wrote, uh, and uh, you know nowadays uh, all those Star Wars movies are heavily subtitled. I I, I mentioned we were, I was talking, I dropped a, a small name. I was talking to Lupita Nyong'o, and I mentioned that it, she doesn't speak a word of any known language in any of those Star Wars movies. Um, and you also you don't recognize her as Lupita Nyong'o because she's she may be a CGI character or a puppet, and she may just be doing a voiceover. It's a closely guarded secret. I don't know. Who we Lupita couldn't use subtitles. They wouldn't let us use subtitles. In Who's Lupita Nyong'o? I don't know that name. Lupita Nyong'o won an Academy Award for a picture called 12 Years a Slave. Right. And she has been in, in all the recent Star Wars movies. And I don't know. Her character's name is one of those names that has 15 consonants and no vowels. And <laughs> she's, she's a oh. tiny little creature. Yeah, she's, help me out, Greg. She's, she's the little one. Oh God, yeah, I know. She's yeah. a little. She's like an arms dealer and a spy. And right, and they go to the monk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's the one that gives Ray, like, helps Ray find the lightsaber or something. But in her other life, Lupita <clears throat> Nyong'o has had has had a film career since she won the Oscar, which was not for her first movie, but for her first well-known movie. Well, yeah, I've seen Twelve Years a Slave. I just didn't recognize the name. But you know, I don't really. I mean, I know this is blasphemy, but I don't think I've watched the Oscars in like twenty years. Well, you know, you're probably joining the crowd that won't watch it for another twenty years after this year. So, <laughs> did something happen this year that? Well, what I mean, besides well, what the pandemic, wants is a, a, a low key intimate Oscar show. That's why they tune in. <laughs> oh, sorry. Wasn't it like they had like all the tables apart or something, and people couldn't they, remember looked, when they went to Union Station and they they uh, look, they took a side room at Union Station and decorated it like the gym. It looked like the gym, you know, with when they do enchantment under the sea, like it's a like, high school dance. Yeah, high school dance. <laughs> like they turn the bleachers into a into kind of a nightclub, and they hang draperies over the hoops, and that's what it looked like. It was just it was it was shockingly bad. 
I mean, the whole thing was, I mean, they made every rookie mistake you could make. I've written 25 of them, so I can tell you, they've made every mistake. And so, so, speaking of, uh, so speaking of altered substances, you must have worked yeah. for Sid and Marty Craft, right? I did. I did Donnie and Marie. I did the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. What's the dirt on those guys? Were they, tripping, were they tripping balls every day? They seem <laughs> Sid, nuts. Uh, Sid was a big, uh, he was a stoner. I mean, you know, he came up with a show called Lidsville. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. And and H R Puffin stuff. I mean, oh, yeah. what is your next clue? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Sigmund and the Sea Monsters was the next that one. That baby. You, now you're talking <laughs> Legend of the Lost. Land, whatever that was. Land, Land of the Lost. Lost. Uh, the Slee Stacks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was all Sid. Marty, Marty's the executor of all of these things that Sid. Uh, when I did the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, which, which was followed Donnie and Marie. Donnie and Marie had opened with a number on ice every week. Yeah. And uh, we called, we, we were going to call them the Ice Angels, but the Mormons wouldn't let us because they, they wouldn't let us use, they don't believe in angels or they wouldn't let us use uh, the word angels to refer to uh, ice skaters. So we called them something else. But uh, when we did the Brady Bunch, Sid decided he wanted to have a water ballet open the show every week that the Bradys were living in a house that had a pool that could have 36 mermaids. <laughs> and I remember when he pitched this idea, he said, we have 36 mermaids, and then they'll dive off of a waterfall. And there was silence, and Marty said, 18 mermaids. <laughs> and that was their relationship. Sid would come up with these ideas, and Marty would say, mm, that would, that, that So that Sid would go out into the desert, drop some peyote buttons. Come up with these yeah, ideas. I, may, probably. I mean, he he's still he's around. He's in his eighties. I've uh, they got a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and I, I helped present it to them. And he still has his hair. I mean, it's not a wig. It is he's it's his hair. It's great curly Greek hair, and he lives in what looks like a, a Hobbit country on the top of Laurel Canyon, and he's been there for about fifty years plus, in a house way up on the top of a, of a private drive. It, I mean, it's his own world. It says, uh, I keep expecting like small woodland creatures to come greet you when you, when you go visit him. Maybe Slee Stack would come down the, you know, driveway <laughs> I, to guard I the house. I suspect that he has, his bedroom was on the top of the house and is glass walled and has a view of the city and all of that. And I imagine after a couple of bongs, you would see Slee Stacks coming over the hill that <laughs> It's the kind of environment where that would not be un, un, unlikely. <laughs> They're all but just hanging out. This, I mean, you know, he is, he's brilliant. I mean, he's, he was a puppeteer. He started as a puppeteer, and they started their whole business with puppet shows. And they, they came up with the idea of adult puppet shows. And they had a review called Les Poupées de Paris, which ran in New York for many years and in London. And it was topless puppets. Now, if you can imagine, they're wood, right? They're wood and they're plastic. And they have, I mean, you know, they have Beverly Hills surgery tits. These, these oh, those right. kind of puppets. People flock to see topless pieces of wood. It was... Well, it's kind of like a Team oh, America yeah, World Police. State, could this idea, and it was a very popular show. That's and probably where a team, the guys those. from uh, South Park got the idea for Team America uh, World Police. Where oh, they absolutely, yeah. Had the uh, well, the no, marionettes I mean, having sex with oh, each probably, other. Probably, yeah. They, I mean, yeah. They, they, I think they were more like the the, the uh, anime and the, the claymation and the, the Japanimation stuff that was a few years before. I think that's really where they got their inspiration. But because uh, I don't really feature Matt and Trey knowing about Les Poupées de Paris. <laughs> that, that's not quite in their wheelhouse, but, uh, but I think anything that, with Le Poupe. Yeah. What? I think anything with Le Poupe should get their attention. Anything with Poupe would go right into their wheel. No question. <laughs> so, in doing research it about you, Bruce, I found out something that was a uh, very um, kind of made my mommy issues intensify because I was very resentful <laughs> that my mom never let me be a charming chub like you. Oh well, I would have liked to be a charming job? chub. I was a charming I think they chub. were gone by the time you were a charming chub. This was this was the oh. thing of the fifties. Um, Lane Bryant, which uh, was a store that specialized in the forgotten woman. This is before there were plus sizes and plus size models, uh, so that you, so uh, uh, fat women had to go shop in a specialty store to get. Uh, there was no dress barn, so to get nice clothes, they had to go to Lane Bryant, and Lane Bryant decided to go in, into a. Uh, Chil fat children's line. I guess there were not enough fat women. Go no. 
you couldn't go by me. So, uh, and I was a model for the, the charming chums. I was one of the one of the fat boys that they, uh, little kids that they chose to be, to be to model this stuff. And then I became a stylish stout, and uh, <laughs> and then I became a husky, and my career ended. A hollow husky. husky. Yeah, when you're a husky, you're neither man nor boy. Yes. <laughs> so you're, that was your first that, foray. That horrible, that horrible wasteland between being a man and a boy. I have a giant wasteland personally. But anyway, <laughs> with uh, with was that your first foray into the entertainment business as being a model, so to speak? Uh, probably it was. I was a child actor and it, okay. it all happened around the same time. And um, uh, but I was always a, a cut up. You know, my parents and my mother was starstruck. And she loved that I enjoyed performing and I would do it in front of the mirror. And I, whenever there was company, I would come out dancing and she loved all that. And uh, I think she wanted, it always was what she wanted. And they said she'd gotten married to a doctor and had a bed and had a kid. I, I was their kid. And, um, uh, but she wasn't like, you know, gypsy. It wasn't like mama Rose pushing me out. Hang out Louise. It wasn't any of that. She just, I was happy doing it. And so they enabled me, you know, they just, they were just afraid I wouldn't be able to make a living doing it. <laughs> but they weren't the kind of stage parents that made a living off of the kid. Yeah. Anything that I made went into, you know, Bruce's college fund. It wasn't like a lot of the, the reasons they have the laws about uh, and kids, child actors who make a lot of money uh, and they're supporting the whole family. And Yeah, if uh, this was back in the 50s, it probably quite had quite quite gotten to that industry level yet i would think well it had but i wasn't yeah. at that level i mean it was back actually in the in the 30s jackie cooper mm. who was a huge movie star a kid he was the, the star of the kid and the champ and all of these movies with charlie chaplin and he made a fortune and he wound up he was the first famous one to emancipate himself from his parents because they were they were bleeding him dry he was 12 years old and they were bleeding him dry they were all <laughs> living off of him and it was crazy but so the, there were, that was the first, the emancipation laws happened way back then. Oh, okay. But, you know, there isn't too much occasion to use them because there aren't that many kids who are, you know, so big that they support their parents. Maybe more now because they're influencers. Right. They're, they're YouTubers. Influencers, or... you know, I don't know how they make money. I mean, they make money because after they influence, they, they get hired by people who pay them to do it. So Lane Bryan was the kind of place where Edna Turnblad to shop. Oh, I've Lynn Bryant. Yeah, if she could afford it, it was right. a little bit above uh, above her wallet. I think. I yeah, she's not a, she was out of Baltimore, Lane Greg. Baltimore. So Baltimore that. didn't have Lane Bryant, I think. Oh, yeah, there was no Lane Bryant. I know. I'd have to ask. I have to ask John Waters. Paid the Moo Moo Hunt. Uh, <laughs> John Waters is the resident Baltimore expert. He's hysterical. I mean, you consider yes. Baltimore. Until John Waters came along, the two most famous people from Baltimore were Edgar Allan Poe and Cal Ripken. And that gives you an idea of what Baltimore is like, right? <laughs> well, I lived, in, I lived in the Baltimore area for a minute. <laughs> I lived in the Baltimore area for many years, so you're quite right. I mean, but John Waters was an icon in the Baltimore area when I was living there, which is back in the 80s. Okay. And uh, so yeah. I knew the bar that he hung out at, but I never saw him when I went to visit. So it was... the irony is uh, uh, when they when the Hairspray musical was such a hit on Broadway, uh, they got made the deal to do the Hairspray movie with John Travolta, and they had to shoot it in Toronto because Baltimore was too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I made twelve pictures in Baltimore for a dollar ninety eight. Now they're in Toronto replicating Baltimore from nineteen sixty two. I'm sure that dollar amount's correct. I used to work at a telemarketing company where one of his um, coterie of actors also made extra money as the same tar uh, telemarketing place. Um, the guy who played Mr. Pinky in the first Hairspray. Yeah. Yeah. He and I were like three chairs away from each other selling magazines. I believe I, uh, we opened the tour. I, I did the first national tour and then went to Broadway for a year. And we opened the first national tour in Baltimore, of course. We were the last show to play the Mechanic Theater. And um, we had a big, a huge party, and all the original cast of the movie, the first movie, came. And they were all like, you know, oh, I'm an accountant. Oh, I run a garage. Oh, I do this. I do this. Nobody had, like, you know, nobody had reached Mink Stoll level. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know he was an actor. I saw the movie and went, wait a second, that's Max, and which isn't actually his real name. I don't think he, I think, <laughs> I think John just cast him where he found him. Yeah. He, 
he looked for types and he just uh, he just brought them in. Yeah, and that guy wanted to be in, I think, about three or four of John Waters' movies, too, in these small well, parts. Well, why not? Like, they were like, there. Yeah, he was in Peckery, played the uh, the owner of the strip club, and uh, there was like another one I can't remember. Anyway, but um, I, I find your career quite fascinating because you started off a, as a writer, as a journalist in Ohio, and then you moved to Chicago to work with, underneath Gene Siskel at the Chicago Tribune. And that's that true. Right, and then you... Um, Somewhere along the line, you got connected to Bud Freeman from the Improv in New York, though. How did that come about? Uh, well, he had uh, he was he used to manage people who would play the Improv, and he managed a kid named Freddie Prinz. And uh, Freddie he put he sent Freddie to Chicago to play a club a club called Mr. Kelly's, and uh, I went to see him because I was writing. I was like the second string everything, uh -huh. and I went to see him. And uh, I I had met Bud in New York. Just going to the improv, I guess. So he called me and said, would you do me a favor and go review this kid? And if you like him, print something. And uh, I, I thought he was great. He was the open act for Jonah Jones, who's a jazz uh, cellist, a jazz a xylophonist like Lionel Hampton. And, uh, and Jonah Jones' crowd was not the least bit interested in anything Freddie had to say. So uh, I gave him a great review, though, and I interviewed him, and we became friends. And he went back to New York, and uh, that's how I became friendly with But a year later, uh, Freddie got Chico and the Man, a television, a Norman Lear TV series. And a year later, he was a gigantic star. Right. And he came back and headlined at Kelly's and did the exact same act word for word. <laughs> and, and they went screaming with laughter. They were, it was because they were there to see him and they adored him. Now he didn't change a word. And afterwards he came back to me and said, you're the only person who knows, who knows what I did. <laughs> anyway, so that's how I got friendly with Bud Friedman. Another person at the improv was Bette Midler. Uh, she was in Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway playing one of the daughters. And she would go down the street to the improv after the show and uh, get up and sing and, and talk for a bit. And Bud signed her and he sent her to, to Mr. Kelly's also. And the same thing happened to her. She came, she opened for Jackie Vernon, who was a deadpan comic. I don't know if you remember him, but he would, he never cracked a smile. He would come out and say, when I was a kid, I was unwanted. Now I am wanted in 13 states. I've heard I, that joke. So. Yeah, but I was Jackie Vernon. He's lived on at least to that got, form. It, I mean, it, it never goes away. And uh, they didn't know what to make of her either, but I thought she was fabulous. And I did the same thing. I wrote a review. And I interviewed her and she called the day after the interview came out and said, that's a very funny interview. You're a funny writer. I said, well, you should talk more on stage. You're funny. She said, you got any lines? And that was the beginning. And that was only 50 years ago. <laughs> so you're writing comedy for Bette Miller, but prior to that, you were writing reviews. Did you consider yourself a humor writer? Yes. Oh, I was okay. a, I, I always, I was, I mean, uh, I was a feature writer and, um, specializing in show business, you know, so I would do the interviews of people coming through town, plugging a movie, a, a play, a book, a TV show, um, a record. And I was a reviewer and uh, it was always, my emphasis was always on funny, strange stuff. I did a series of stunt kind of things where I got myself into Guinness book and uh, really, uh, yeah, I'm for, I, 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 hold, I believe I hold the record for walking sideways. <laughs> just walking it's sideways probably, like, it was I mean, 50 years ago i'm sure somebody has, has found a way to break it but uh, <laughs> uh it was it was a challenge but I, it, it wasn't like it, how many marbles you could shove up your nose that's good there was that it was how many uh how many donuts you could eat i entered that one and and threw up after about 30 <laughs> and uh uh the, could you make the world's largest pizza i did but there was you know it was in the the press room of the chicago tribune which we set on almost set on fire <laughs> like that there's all kinds of stuff like that so and, you, you so knew that, you were funny so did you crack up co-workers and what have you is that uh, i hope <laughs> as they all stand yeah, around stoically yeah that was funny well, you know, it's a very, i'll tell you something uh, uh newspapers media it, it's a very it's a when you're in the, the the belly of the beast it's a very serious place yes because you are basically reporting everybody else's misbehavior and you become very cynical very fast. And that's why the, the uh, cliche of the hard drinking newsman is not wrong. Because the, the, a lot of people, the people's defense for what they have to do every day is to just disappear into their own world of substance abuse. 
And, uh, um, but I'm, you know, more of a lighthearted character and I, I wasn't really interested in covering that stuff, but so I was, I was kind of a one man comic relief in that, in that place because uh, they, they were all were like, you know, they all had serious jobs to do. And of course, you know, real journalists as opposed to people on Fox News pay attention to the accuracy of the story and the truth. And, uh, and they're always under, if not an, a, a, a guillotine, you're always under the, the guilt factor that you're going to somehow screw it up. And you're not going to, uh, you're going to print something that's factually incorrect. And yeah. then you can be, you know, you can be called for. Now it doesn't seem to matter because as uh, Kellyanne Conway, or as I finally call her sewer rat Barbie, <laughs> and, well, those are alternate facts. She has alternate facts. I, I really, I really hope to see a line of sewer rat Barbies coming out of Mattel. I'm now, and what? Why not? What? What's keeping yeah. <laughs> or the Scarecrow Barbie for the above ground version? <laughs> When I like she's, sewer rat. When she's not dressed like oh, it. Think, yeah. Brain like, dead Barbie. <laughs> well, so, so lot, even the husband a, doesn't get that. So yeah, say, that's a lot of that's a lot of Barbies, isn't it? That, enough for a Barbie party. I guess if you're in Australia, Barbie, you can even put Barbie. shrimp on her. Put shrimp on her head. You have a shrimp on a sewer rat Barbie. God, these Bruce, are, I was very uh, yeah, proud to drink. You were involved with that. Uh, you were involved with Can't Stop the Music, one of my favorite worst movies it's of all another time. Another work of rare genius. I mean, can't oh my stop God. The mu- this, what's this Can't little, Stop the Music? This book I'll be plugging the next time I see you. It was the Village <laughs> People movie. The Village People had their own movie. And I would like in the 90s have a videotape of it. And every time we were drunk, some friend was over. I'm like, you have to see this movie. It is so funnily bad. I, uh, Hilarious I, they, when they issued the 30th anniversary DVD, I am a DVD extra. Ooh. I sit there with Jeffrey Schwartz, who did a, a, a documentary about Alan Carr, who produced it, and I'm also in the documentary. And uh, and we sit there and we do like a mystery science theater of the movie. Ooh, we nice. I want to see that. What notes on all your favorite parts? It's still weird because Alan Carr did Grease, right? Yes, he did. And I love that movie. That's such a great movie. Yeah. I can't believe he did such a turn. It was, it was well, you know, people. Shakespeare wrote, uh, you know, Macbeth, and he also wrote Henry the Fifth. Or Turner and Hooch. Titus Andronicus. I mean, he wrote some of the Shakespeare, some Shakespeare wouldn't thrill you too much, but it's all Shakespeare. So there's always mm-hmm. something in there for you to appreciate. But uh, yeah, I mean, people do things that are good and people do things that are not so good. However, I mean, Greece, uh, he wasn't allowed to, to, uh, <laughs> To fly his freak flag fully, <laughs> Greece was which a huge, he does. He can't stop the music. Broadway success, and he his job was not to screw it up, and he he did what he did best, which is to promote it. He's a but the promoter non pariah. Can't stop the music was his baby from the the, the germ of an idea, and uh, and there was nobody to tell him this is not this is not a good idea. So what would you say is the biggest stain on your career? Do you, would you, if you don't mind tossing the that biggest one out? Sta- well, oh, I don't know if it's a stain because it's gone away. So it's, you can get stains out, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, yeah. wash them. Personally, I, WD-40. I, yeah. I guess putting Ted Danson in blackface was pretty bad. That was your idea. <laughs> it was Whoopi's idea. Oh, okay. And, and, and you have to say Whoopi and Ted were a couple. They had lived together for three years, right. during which time they had gotten the most horrifying threats and hate mail and you know dog shit thrown at them and unbelievable stuff. And um, yeah, I'm sure their uh, targets they were, were racist. They, yeah. they had made this commitment to the Friars Club to, uh, to uh, roast Whoopi and Ted was going to be the roast master. And, and as they were pulling it together, they kind of decided that they were, they were breaking up and this would be their, their opening farewell. And so they decided that he would, uh, we would do a show where he would come out as a, and do every possible awful racist joke he could oh about her. <laughs> and to just make it, to, uh, to, to put the cherry on the ice, on the cake, he would be in blackface. Now, we were planning this for a Friars Club event, which would be a small, not, you know, a few hundred people who were in the Friars Club. And the Friars Club roasts were, were not like the Dean Martin show or, or Comedy Central. They were truly, uh, all the gloves were off and no holds barred. And um, we 
discovered too late that they had thrown this open to the public. Oh. And it was in the ballroom of the New York Hilton, and people could buy tickets, and they were expecting to see the Dean Martin show. <laughs> and, and, we, and he came out there, and it was horrifying because they were truly horrified. <laughs> and I was horrified because of, he didn't deserve that. And when you're out there and black, you can't say, excuse me, I'll be right back. Where's the cold cream? I mean, he was stuck out there. <laughs> and in addition, like some of the people on the dais piled on him, not Whoopi. They, they threw out their Whoopi jokes. And they started piling on Ted. I mean, Roger Ebert, who was married to a black woman, was outraged. David Dinkins, the mayor of New York, who was black, he was outraged. Um, uh, oh, God, what's his name? He had a talk show, and now he has MS. That's not related. But uh, Montel, <laughs> Montel Williams, he decided to, to get on a high horse. And Chris Rock was the only one who was there who said, cut this guy a break for three years. You know, every day they went to the mailbox and there was your nigger lover in, in, in the mailbox. Yeah. I said, Cut this guy a break. And uh, it was just, I, you know, I felt like it was watching, a, you know, putting all, everybody you love on a plane and watching it crash. It were the awesome. Friar Club's regulars, though, were they laughing? Oh, the screaming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, because they were, they got it. They were in the Yeah, city. yeah. But anyway, the Friars Club bought a full page ad in the New York Times the next day and uh, um, Variety and the Hollywood Reporter explaining that. Uh, it was their fault that they hadn't told us that they were going to do this and that they were making substantial contributions to a whole list of charities uh, to make amends for for allowing this thing to happen. And, you think they would have uh, just had like one big white sheet there with on um, the words, whole, fuck if you can't take a joke. Well, that would have been the ad know, in the New I York mean, Times. Certainly that would have been, but I, yeah, you're not allowed to do that anymore. I mean, no, of course. That's, that's white privilege. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, but how is this a stain on your career if it was Whoopi's idea? Is it you orchestrated it or? I, I didn't. I did. I oh. mean, she kept me away from it. She said, I'm going to take all the blame for this. You didn't do any of this. I said, okay, fine. But you asked me what was my, didn't you ask me what was uh, the biggest you know, stain on your career? Yeah. But I, was, I mean, I was... as far as I'm concerned, uh, you'd have to ask somebody else what the biggest stain was on my career. Did you write some of Ted Danson's jokes that night? Yeah. He... Oh, so you wrote the jokes. I wrote, yeah, I wrote the thing. I mean, did he say it like in an Amos and Andy voice? Sorry? Did he say it in an Amos and Andy type voice? Was he talking in a... No, dialect? no, he was, he was himself. He was, no, he didn't do impressions. That would have been... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think... I, I, he, he doesn't do that. You know, he's, I mean, he's always Ted, right? Yeah. So he doesn't, uh, he doesn't... He's the nicest guy in the world. He really is a sweetheart. And they're very friendly now. They've been friendly ever since. They just, they were done being a couple. They were done fighting the world. Man. Well, this is actually a perfect opportunity to go into our client for today, which is when words collide. Essentially, it's the concept is defining at what point do words become offensive. We figured you'd be a really good fake attorney to address this particular one, especially okay. considering the word that you used a few minutes ago. Um, in terms of at well, what context stage... Context is everything. Yes, context definitely helps. Uh, every, you know, in, 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 that's a preface to this. If you're in the proper context, you can say anything. That's what's horrible about about right now is that they want to they want to cancel context. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like context the, has been know, eliminated. Absolutely. Yeah, like they're a mother and you're a three year old. You know, I mean, this, yeah. is not the way, this is not how the world should be. It's stupid. I've heard a lot of comedians talk about it. Have you had the experience where you know a joke that you think is pretty damn clever, but it's a little where the audience will just turn against you now because they're like. Oh, he shouldn't have said that. Yes, yeah, I can't think of one uh, specifically, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, from some years back. I mean, this is not brand new. It's just now everybody is. Ha we have the internet. We have narcissism central, and we have keyboard. <laughs> we have keyboard warriors, and the internet is the only place where your first draft can be published, and nobody can. <laughs> there's no filter, and there's no, no censorship. So you know, since people have the right to carry on and scream, they are carrying on and screaming. They didn't have the wherewithal to do it pretty much before. But I did uh, some years ago uh, on the Tony Awards of all places, which is the Broadway Awards. Uh, we had uh, Carol Channing was presenting an award. And uh, because it's, Tony's were on CBS, they like to throw in stars of CBS shows, whether they're Broadway or not. 
to uh, capitalize on them. So, so like they, Walter Cronkite doing a dance number or something. It's like Carol Channing and LL Cool J. Okay. <laughs> star of NCIS, LA, <laughs> presenting an award together. Nice. So I, I said, wouldn't it be funny if Carol rapped? <laughs> and so I wrote this, this rap for Carol to do. And LL Cool J thought it was hysterical. Uh, and I had worked with him before. I had been his, it's a long story, but uh, so they showed up and um, Carol couldn't read the uh, monitor. So I, but she has these hysterically huge glasses that she wears and that they're shaded and she was wearing bling, you know, she was wearing bling kind of jewelry. And so she looked like somebody from the hood when she put the glasses on. And I said, just read it through those glasses. And the two of them did, and it was hysterical. It brought the house down. And then Hugh Jackman was the host and he came on, there was a commercial and he came on afterwards and I gave him this joke. He said, this just in, Carol Channing has been arrested in a drive-by shooting. <laughs> and the audience screamed, okay. Then I get, I go backstage and the network censor is there. And she says, you know, not all gang members are criminals. And you're saying that because she's a gang member, I said, you are overthinking this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carol Channing's just, not in a gang, lady. Just go with it. <laughs> Nobody is thinking Carol Channing is making a political state or Hugh Jack would make a political statement about gang warfare. That's it. <laughs> Come with me and I will take you to LL Cool J and we will settle this right now. And she, she backed off. She said, no, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, with our current culture, things have definitely gotten to a stage where people are easily offended about things. But there's a that point. Was, there's like that a tipping was like point. The tip right? of the iceberg, and it was yeah. 20 years ago. Tip right. <laughs> but there's like a tipping point when you can say a word and it's fine, and then yeah. there's a point where it's now no longer fine. It's like, how many people have to get offended by a word before things are finally offensive? There's the loudest no people is there. What was that? The loudest people. So well, that's probably the answer the loudest people, yeah. yeah. I mean, because you, listen, you, you stumble over something, you have no idea you've actually offended somebody. And then when you defend yourself, they say, white privilege, you know, so you get, there's no defense. <laughs> you know, I can say, hey, I'm gay, I'm a Jew. Do I qualify as a minority? <laughs> yeah, I think you do. I'm sorry about the white part. Ah, but you're uh, blonde. You're white. <laughs> Especially growing up gay in the 50s. That must have been yeah. hard. Well, occasionally. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I just walked into that on Contra, Greg. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I mean, it up. was, uh, I, I actually was, uh, the Judy generation was right before me. I mean, I. The Judys uh, were the ones who predated the Karens or something? Uh, no, Judy, Judy Garland. Garland. They were the, the, oh. the, the old school queens who were Judy Garland fans who could oh. be found sitting at a bar smoking and weeping to the man that got away. I mean, they were, they, they, and they also lived in an era where you could uh, be arrested for touching somebody in a bar because he was a vice cop. He was there to entrap you because mm -hmm. it was an easy collar and they had to meet, they had to reach a certain quota of bail. Yeah. For, so they, they would send people, they would send hot cops out into the parks to lure unsuspecting homosexuals. That sounds like a great reality show. Well, it was called Cruising with Al Pacino. I mean, it was a, it was a <laughs> notorious movie where he was top and they get they make him get become a leather queen, but he's he's trying to find a serial killer, so it's all right. So is that the true story of Al Pacino, Cruising? Yes, dear. Okay. What's your next question? <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to confirm that. I just want, okay, if, you, if it's important <laughs> for you to know this, yes. Yes, that's, I don't all, that that's, how he gets, that's how he gets all those parts, Al Pacino. He's on <laughs> he's knee pads to every audition. <laughs> it's either doing that or volleyball, right? Well, well <laughs> commando, only a commando. Or hanging out with gerbils. Gerbils? Yeah. He has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, tell me, Greg, what are you talking yeah. about? Why would Pacino be involved with gerbils? Well, it was Richard Gere. Some people referring to Richard Gere. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of the wrong actor. Uh, were no, you just not aware of the Richard Gere gerbil story? Oh, yeah, he's, yeah. he's very aware. I, of I'm it. aware of that. I just didn't know what he was that. talking about with Pacino, though. I'm like, where did this come from? He, he was. Stretch. It's called a in, joke. In the, yeah. in the world of segues, Greg, that was about the worst segue ever. But, but go ahead. <laughs> no, I don't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it. I just was making a joke. Sorry. 
Okay, okay, I'll give you one with old when the year that Richard, the whole scandal happened with Richard. Uh, he, we, he was on the Oscar show. He was uh, presenting. He wanted to do something serious, and Billy was hosting it. Billy Crystal was hosting, it, and we had a joke. Um, that was the year. Uh, uh, there was a picture called "An American Tale," which was a, a, oh, a the cartoon, like, right? Sorry, yeah. Five of the Mouse, Five of yeah. the Mouse. And the joke was Richard Gere was going to present me with Five but Five backed out. <laughs> and everybody that's loved a, the joke. And then we that's a good joke. the audience and we realized he would drop dead if we did that joke. <laughs> so Billy said, We're cutting the joke. We can't do that. We just can't do that. Because you know, when you're sitting in the in the Oscar audience and you're not nominated and you have nothing to do with it, and you see a guy with a camera stealthily coming up the aisle to get a reaction shot from you, you know that there's about to be a joke about you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the and setup. The color right? drains because it's like, what am I going to happen now? Anyway, but that was uh, that was it was a very hot joke topic for a so while. So has there been anything like that that's actually offended you during your career? Oh my God, probably. But, because uh, you seem to be pretty thick-skinned. So I'm. A, I mean, about me or or. Uh, I, I don't know anything that anyway, we just went. It's true, and I own it all. <laughs> Bring it on. I'm curious um, what the best joke about you was. Did somebody I ever no, like? I, no, I, I have no idea. I haven't collected them. <laughs> I have. I mean, I like when they. I like when they. Uh, they use me as a like a, a, a shout out, and I, I'm, or a punchline, or uh, I don't know. I was looking at Arrested Development the other night, and Jason Bateman. Somebody said something to him, and he said, "You know, that doesn't sound like you. That sounds like Mom or Bruce Valanche." <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing it was a double entendre cock joke, is what all I could hear. But uh, I didn't hear. I didn't pick up what it was. So, uh, but uh, I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I haven't. Haven't thought about it. Okay. I mean, a lot of, you know, it's hard sometimes. You know, they, it's hard to decide when they're mean spirited and when right. they're just funny. Uh, so I, I, uh, I choose to to take to take. I recuse myself from having a reaction. I'm sure you've had any jokes. I was just saying, I'm sure there's been plenty of mean-spirited people you've had to deal with in Hollywood yeah, in terms uh -huh. of, yeah. with your career. Who has been the biggest battle with to be able to attain something that you wanted to achieve? Wow. Marie. Uh, <laughs> Marie. Oh, that's right. He had to fight the Mormons on Donnie Marie. I, but, you know, I never viewed it as fun. I mean, it was fun. It was, it was, uh, every, everything is a negotiation. I, I couldn't qualify which one was the worst or the Everything really is a negotiation. It, it's uh, I mean, like if somebody took something pers made something personal to you that you were I attempting. Guess, you know, I, I suppose uh, when I, I did the Franco Hathaway Oscar show, and uh, I was on a red carpet a week later, and I was defending James, and I said he wasn't really in his comfort zone. It's not the kind of thing he does, and all that. And he kind of came back at me online with uh, with. Uh, I was I had a great time and, and he was like it was crazy because I know none of that was true and I, I, he was just like uh, and it was there was there was a tinge of meanness which surprised me but then of course I, I think he's a very mercurial personality and now as we've seen where he's kind of self-destructed or if that's the word <laughs> self-destructed. Are there any yeah. jokes that you, do you ever censor your own joke writing where you're like oh that's just too far or you're, you're pretty time. much. All the okay. time. Yeah. Have you offended I mean, yourself by your jokes? Sometimes. Sometimes. It's just, <laughs> right. Oh, that's just, no. Oh, no. no I could. So, but still so, them, so right? these are the jokes we want to hear then. Uh, <laughs> if you still yeah, can remember I'm sure, them. I'm sure you do. I'd like to hear them myself. <laughs> I have censored I'm, them. They're gone. I, I, you know, I should collect them for interviews. But uh, <laughs> I used to do interviews and ask questions like that. What was the one time that you thought, I don't know. I haven't. I don't think. Do you think that way? The one time that something. Do you? Think that way? No, I don't I, have a I, memory people, anymore. When they write their memoirs, I guess they they consolidate. You know, I haven't done that. I'm 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 writing a kind of a memoir, but it's about how I wrote the worst shows in TV history and lived, like the, the Donnie and Marie, Brady Bunch, uh, Star Wars, Can't Stop the Music, about all these terrible things I've been involved in and somehow risen above. So you're kind you of work? responsible for destroying Western civilization all on your own to a certain extent. Yeah, well, it's kind of probably me and Omar Gaddafi. You know. 
Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, him. I forgot about, you know, yeah. Orange China. Did, did you work on a pink uh, lady and Jeff? Was that one of yours? No, I, I didn't do that. I That might have been Sid and Marty, but I didn't do it. It okay. was... Uh, I, I Mark Avenue? What? Mark Avenue. Mark Avenue worked on that. Did you run into Mark Avenue or not back in those no, days? No, I didn't. Uh, Jeff Altman Jeff Altman was was the Jeff and uh, yeah. Jeffrey Barron I, I think may have written on it. I don't know. I I wrote on a bunch. Of, I was probably I wanted to do it because I thought this would be so insane. He it was. So, so, <laughs> I mean, Fred Silverman's craziest idea. Uh, but I was doing something else, I guess, and I just uh, and uh, I couldn't do it. That and and Marie, when he also brought Marie back as a solo. And I worked on that for, for a minute. She was great, but you know, we made her an adult on Donnie Marie. We made a big deal out of her 18th birthday. And she and Bob Mackey came in and started designing grown-up clothing for her. And on her 18th birthday, I had Barry Manilow come out and give her a <laughs> puppy because she, she was in love with him. <laughs> and um so then Perfect. after that, after that ended, she came back a couple of years later on NBC with a show called Marie, and nobody was terribly interested. But uh, um, <laughs> they didn't uh, have a lot of country. They just well, what I just, uh, I just love is she's her opening number was "I'm Coming Out." You know, Diana Ross says, "I'm coming now." Mm -hmm. Had does nobody have any brains over here? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty <laughs> tone deaf. It's got really tone deaf. It's got. Well, I also, I had a, an incident on Donnie and Marie when uh, uh, I was friendly with, I'm friendly with Michael Feinstein, who at the time was working for Ira Gershwin, the great lyricist. And uh, uh, Ira was a fan of, uh, I was over there one night and we were watching Donnie and Marie and he thought she was terrific. And um, uh, there was a song that he had written for Mickey Rooney for one of the Mickey Judy movies called uh, uh, Treat Me Rough. And, and Mickey Rooney did it surrounded by seven foot tall women who were mussing his hair and, you know, and treat me rough, muss my hair and I don't care. And I thought it'd be funny, you know, for Marie to make a statement that she was like um, a grown up. And uh, so I took it to the, uh, to the Osmonds and uh, the Osmonds, oh, well, she couldn't possibly sing this lyric. It's like, you know, she treat me rough, and it's no good. So uh, I, I called Ira and I said, well, they won't let her do it. And he said, I'll write a new lyric. So Ira Gershwin writes her a lyric. <laughs> wow. They still wow. won't do it. They still won't do it. I said, let me explain. Ira Gershwin, this is the Ira Gershwin. <laughs> He's written this for her. No, couldn't possibly. This is U.S. history in the making right now. Right. right. <laughs> I didn't even know we so still They wouldn't let us do it. So um, instead, oh, I brought in uh, Melissa Manchester and Carol Sager had written a song called Coming from the Rain, which Melissa had recorded, a gorgeous song. And... Uh, she loved it, and they said, oh, no, this is about a woman taking back her husband after he's left. Where they got the husband part, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, And so she couldn't possibly sing that. So instead, I brought them a song, an Elton John, Bernie Taupin song, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. <laughs> they loved it. <laughs> oh, that Elton John, he's so peppy. We love his stuff. And there she is. So now we're recording and I'm in the booth watching it. And she says, don't let the sun go down on me. And the same network censor, you know, from the Tony Awards is looking at me saying, you get away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> so you've injected your sensibilities in I various managed, different ways. You are, you're the evil well, genius, always, though, aren't they you? They always viewed me as, as the, the heathen interloper. Because... <laughs> Whenever they would throw some of their Mormon stuff at me, I'd throw some Jewish stuff back at them. <laughs> I think Heathen Interloper should be the name of your band. With <laughs> is what? When you Heathen Interloper. That's Heathen be the Interloper. Name. Yes. I, I, that, <laughs> I mean, because you're at a new stage of your career, because I don't know if you're still working on any projects, but maybe you could go into music now. You know. He has. He wrote a village people people song. I yeah, I, I, Sex I, under I, wrote people I wrote. I had I wrote disco songs for Eartha Kitt, which we had big hits with all over the world. Wow! And, I just, and I've been doing um, during the the um, pandemic. I wrote a musical with uh, Dolly Parton. Interesting. That we're just we're putting together. We're going to workshop it in August. Well, but I guess you have a musical because you were on Broadway and Hairspray for two years. I, was, so yeah. I guess you do have some chops of your own. I saw a clip of that, by the way, and you made a great Edna Turner. You were really good. I, uh, it was very I impressive. Had, it was, 
I had a fabulous time. I do it again in a minute. I mean, it's I mean, I think divine, divine, divine was go up in heaven. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, they're doing another tour of Hairspray, but I think it's not a non-equity tour. But um, they are, and they're doing it again in London with the original London company. But it's it's a great, it's just, it's such a fabulous. Yeah, I was I was picturing Divine up in heaven smiling down on you because you did it so well. Oh, thank you. I knew him, and and uh, we had many uh, laughs when he was out in L.A. trying to do things other than drag. You know, he did Married with Children, and he did a couple of movies. And uh, I've seen those movies where he's a tall man, like he's, yeah, he's a gangster the, in one. He's the one with Sting, in... yeah, Stormy Monday. Is that, that British it? picture he made with Sting? Oh okay. yeah, he, he, he liked playing Sidney Greenstreet. Yeah, you know, it was he was great. He's really great. He was a great actor. Doing that very, very, you know, gruff. Come this way, Mr. Spade. You know that. that uh -huh. Really good. And then yeah, he goes he around a corner. Yeah, he's a great boss. He really is. He was, he's really, really talented. So did you get that sex on the phone gig by meeting the village people when you were working on the movie? Can't yeah. Stop the music? Uh, yeah. I wrote the first draft of Can't Stop the Music and then I quit because he kept having me rewrite it for different women because the women kept passing every time they would. Or, <laughs> he said, well, let's rewrite it for Cher. So I'd rewrite it for Cher and I wasn't getting paid. And I said, Alan, you got to pay me. He said, OK, you're off the picture. <laughs> <laughs> You're not willing to work for free with the right. That's okay. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, uh, Bajak Morali, who created the Village People and wrote the music, uh, had a show in Paris at a club called the Crazy Horse, which was a famous kind of Folie Berger club. Only it was a little smaller, and the and the, the gimmick there was these Amazonian women would come out on stage topless and they would uh, lip sync to famous. Uh, to new songs with famous voices. And he said, uh, he said, I want you to do one for Eartha Kitt. Uh, here's the, the title is Where Is My Man? And he sent me the track and I wrote the lyric and Eartha recorded it. And this seven foot tall blonde woman who could barely stand up without pitching forward, uh, got out there and, and lip synced it. And, uh, and it, was, it worked, it was great. And uh, Jacques sold it as a record in, France and it went to number one on the, the French chart and all over wow. it went all over the world. Every place but the US where they wouldn't play disco on the radio. So we got you should pardon the expression 12 inches and uh, the DJs would uh, play it in the clubs. And so it had a it had a great club life. And, wow. uh, and then we did an album with Eartha. Off of that, we did uh, an album. We went over to Paris and did an album. After dealing with so many celebrities and so many incredibly famous people and talented people over the years, did there ever come a time you were just got completely jaded and you just didn't care how famous somebody was anymore? And you're like, what, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, so said, I'm above you all, or I don't I know do. what kind of I attitude. Do. Brad, I don't care. Let Jennifer have you. It's okay. <laughs> do you ever get starstruck anymore? Yeah. Is there anyone oh, who would make you starstruck? Um, just Gilbert Gottfried, probably. Well, yeah, with huge penis. So it's, I mean, <laughs> I that alone, know. that alone, <laughs> that's the real. <laughs> um, I, you know, I no, I don't think so because uh, because I've been in the business a long time. I mean, it's nice when you know I met Lady Gaga when she was kind of coming up, and um, uh, I'm kind of not starstruck, but I'm struck by how gigantic she's she's become but um uh, i i guess when you meet somebody who you've really been a fan of I, I, you know the the i met so many legends when they were like a little bit past their 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 prime and i wanted to meet them when they were in their prime and um so you you get to realize that they're all human beings right right, and right. It's where you catch them uh, so, uh, and so much of it is an illusion. As Cary Grant told everybody for years and years and years, there is no Cary Grant. We made Cary, I'm Archie, we made Cary Grant up. And mm. if you get a Cary Grant type, there are no Cary Grants. There are people imitating Cary Grant. <laughs> but, sorry, was that the alarm? I don't know what that was. Did I say a bad thing or did somebody <laughs> step on a cat? <laughs> yeah. It sounded like a, someone wheezing. I think that means we need to take a snack break or something. Yeah. I, 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 think that may, I, I think that may have been my dog. Ah. <laughs> yeah, I know Joking. the sounds they make too. It's entirely positive. It's, he's, anyway, I, so. he's pining away for people who've uh. left the house. So. <laughs> I know I have a 15-year-old pug who farts in anxiety. 
Oh. The moment she's just sprawled. She's sprawled. She's enjoying. Greg, it's like a tea time. tea time in Hollywood. It's Greg's that's Greg's spirit animal. A farting pug. <laughs> yes. <A> farting pug. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Probably. a bar. I think that's a bar in Anchorage. I've been to <laughs> the farting <laughs> pug. So, do you, what do you have next coming up? Or do you? You said you made this musical with Dolly Parton. I wrote this musical. We're going to workshop it in in August, probably in New York. It's, it's a small show. It's two characters. It's about a guy who's uh, um, a quarantining at his parents' attic in Texas. And his his uh, intimate relationship with his imaginary friend Dolly Parton. So it's a woman who plays Dolly and another actor and five musicians uh, off stage doing voices and stuff. And it's uh, about and it's all told through her songs, but it's very funny and uh, and wow. kind of a love letter to her. And it's a kind of it's an it's like always Patsy Cline. It's one of those shows that we can take all over. It's I you know I don't we're not aiming it for Broadway. We're just uh, we're you know. You know taking it around and it's yeah you know, people keep saying well you know the pandemic is ending and all that i said yeah but world war ii ended and we still make movies about it i mean <laughs> this thing was an earth shattering two years and right it's not going to go away that fast so no there will be stories there, so, there will be a point when the spanish flu um will get a revival <laughs> well it was supplanted by other bigger flus <laughs> <laughs> right like world war one Sure, yeah. <laughs> or whatever war came up after this. Something is, I mean, this, this total disruptor of, uh, of society for over a year is not going to be fade from memory. No, definitely not. I mean, think of all the kids who just growing up through this and how it's yeah. affected their education. There's nothing else. Maybe it'll have a nostalgic factor for people who really were happy not going out. <laughs> so, I, I wanted to be that person. Yeah. You wanted to be the person who didn't go out? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, just on a practical level, it's like, I don't know, for, you know, going out and and having a babysitter and playing for parking and paying for popcorn and paying for uh, the movie or sitting home and watching Godzilla versus Kong (laughs) (laughs) on my big screen, you know, and having to put up with the dog yowling periodically. I said, that's not, that's not an even trade. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, a lot of people will, will vote for staying at home yeah yeah definitely i mean that was happening prior to the pandemic actually yeah it, it was that was because of it. it gotten so expensive for most people to to go to a movie and plus because mm-hmm. the definition of televisions and the size of them that you could have well, now, your yeah, own sure. movie theater in your house and yeah, but there is something listen there's always there's a social need to be alone in a big room and able to immerse yourself in that you can't do it at home you can pretend you can do it, but you can't really do it. Uh, yeah. And 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 movies will always. I mean, you know, uh, people have to get laid, and movies going to movies is a great way to do it. They have they fulfill a social function for the, the heating somebody up for romance. Especially if you're in a big room and it's all dark inside, and you know, people love to be in a big room and have the shit scared out of them by Annabelle or Chucky or one of those things. And uh, that's not duplicated at home. And it's also, uh, they love to go and see a a big, loud comedy. You know, I mean, there's nothing like sitting in in, in a big theater and watching Maya Rudolph take a dump in her bridal gown in the middle of the street. I mean, that is a a larger than life moment. For a second, I was thinking Maya Angelou when you said that, and it just gave me a completely different picture. Maya Angelou might have had trouble getting to the ground. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she can't pop a squat anymore I worked with Maya Angelou and she was a relentless editor of other people's words I noticed, <laughs> I discovered <laughs> a relentless editor relentless, not so much of her own but other people's words <laughs> it's good when you have the red pen do you ever know, write jokes where even your close friends are like, oh you shouldn't have said that we're like oh you went a little too far does that happen ever? Um, probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there were things, I mean, when I, I came up with the Sophie Tucker jokes for Bet, and there were certain things she just wouldn't say. That, I mean, even uh, the, our rule on those jokes was that we knew, used no dirty words. We only had one joke that had a, a dirty word, I mean, an actual conventional dirty word in it. It was the imagery. Yeah. Um, where are you guys? Are you what part of the country are you in? Well, two of us are in Oregon, and Brendan is in Florida. 
Ah, he's so actually was... stalking Trump right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I asked because the punchline would, would, would that, vary. That, that's why this. So uh, I can sneak on, uh, you know, Mar a Lago. Would vary from city to city. But I mean, one, a, a joke that um, he did at the beginning uh, was I'll never forget it. Uh, I was having a hot, steamy session with my boyfriend Ernie. And I said to him, Ernie, kiss me where it smells. He took me to the caucus, New Jersey. But up bum. Yeah, but up bum. This is one of the original but up bums. I got to say, though, you sounded just like Bette Midler the way you Thanks. said that. Well, you know, it's part of everything you know about Sophie <laughs> Tucker. She uh, eventually, she said, I mean, you always got a huge laugh when we would change it in every city. And she finally said, I just can't do that joke anymore. The image, she said, is just <laughs> where it smells. She said, it's kind of misogynistic. It's just, yeah. I don't know. I just, of course, you couldn't, you couldn't do it now at all because it has me too stamped all over. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it's, um, but Unless you're talking about kissing her on the nose. Saying, something. Yeah, I beg your pardon. <laughs> that context, 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 context is someone who has no context. Context. It's all about context. What were you saying, Greg? Oh, I was just saying, Bette Midler seems like someone who has no filter, at least in her younger days. She was sassy and brassy. <laughs> she, uh, yeah, well, yeah. So, I mean, yes. Yeah, but as we, as she got older, was, she couldn't look like Pandora opened her box and this is the last thing that flew out of it. I mean, <laughs> she had to grow with with, uh, with her her maturity. It was nothing yeah. sadder than, you know, those those biker chicks with the, with the tattoos and that they got when they were 16 and now they're in their 50s and the, you know, the tattoos are like hanging. Yeah. And then they get become like a picture that but the, I, I saw a hysterical meme from that uh, um, of an old biker, an old biker chick. And she's she's wearing a, a bikini top and the tits are all the way down, like like Bob Mack designed for Carol Burnett. <laughs> and, uh, and she's got a tattoo over her belly button with an arrow pointing down to her snatch and it says boner garage. And I thought, yeah, she got that when she was 18 and, and it was hysterical. And she was like, this phone, which I thought was off. Keep <laughs> ringing. That's because uh, you're a popular man. Um, the, uh, so, you know, that, that stuff doesn't wear well. So, I mean, we had the equivalent of that in Beth Sachs. She couldn't continue to be one, the last of the truly trashy women, especially when she was, you know, a big millionaire movie star. It was uh, for 10 years she didn't work live because she was making movies. And when she came back out of, out of that, when we went back to work live, uh, she, she had to address the fact that a lot of people didn't know her from the early days. And there was a whole hardcore that did and were expecting a certain amount of something like Sophie Tucker. And then there were a whole bunch of people who thought she signed these big ballads that were, you know, you're the wind breathes my wings and from a distance God is watching us and all that stuff. And so they were kind of amazed that she that she would get out there and crack dirty jokes. So, you know, from the bathhouses. From the bathhouses, exactly. Well, that, as we always say, when she dies, the headline will be, Bette Midler dies, singer started in gay bathhouses. <laughs> I guess there's that, a point where you go from edgy you go from edgy to mainstream at some point I would think well yeah I mean sure because the edge keeps shifting and like society yeah, has shifted I, in a certain way it, uh, yeah, and it, all, it all depends on what you're selling I mean it's one of the reasons why Chappelle took a step back because I think he he didn't know what the next thing was going to be and then he kind of came back and uh, he has now he has a lot of you know, meat that he can tear into because it's, it's what are some of the comedians that you really admire today, Bruce. Who are I some of your Don favorite? Mulaney. I think Don Mulaney is hysterical and funny and and uh, uh, bright. And uh, I hope he's, he's conquering. I mean, I've worked with him and I didn't notice any demons, but I hope he's conquering the demons that he obviously has announced he has. Um, the, he, uh, he, Eddie Izzard, I think, is brilliant, and uh, although he's going through some wild transition, finally, where where he's finally telling us all it wasn't a stunt, it wasn't a joke, he really is non-binary. So I always thought he was. I always thought he was forthright about it. Well, I always thought it was a gimmick, frankly. I thought um, um, because of the way he couched it, you know, I'm 
uh, he had a new word, a trans, um, a trans. It was, it was an executive transvestite. Executive transvestite. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I thought it was like a, a shtick. I, I mean, I, you know, didn't judge it, but I right. thought what it was. And he would come on with, with more makeup than usual and, and uh, you know, nail polish and occasionally uh, low heels. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, the material was always brilliant. I mean, really, on a very high level. So I, I, crazy about him. But you know, I also liked. I loved Rodney. Rodney was amazing because he was he was such he had such a character and he was such a showman and he was just so funny. I mean, Rodney would get out there and he would get laughs on things that weren't jokes. Yeah. You know, he would come out and he'd say, "My wife is fat. Oh boy, is she fat." And they break <laughs> up on that. <laughs> oh boy, it's like. Like he's, he's telling me he's serious, and that's yeah. funny. Oh boy! Oh boy! Is she fat? <laughs> Did you write jokes for Rodney? I wrote Did a he? few, not many, yeah. a of things for television. And every now and again, I would see him and I would give him something. But he was uh, uh, no, he had he had some guys who were like who really was like Carnegie Deli, you know, like old Jews, and they would sit around and they would they'd been with him forever. You know, he he got so famous so late in life. I mean, he had to be, you know, over almost 60, I think, when he, when he really got famous, famous. So he had been around a long time, but he had established the club earlier. And uh, so he'd given a lot of people their starts at Dangerfield. And so he was much loved, but he was all, and he was out of his mind, crazy. He'd show up for meetings in a bathrobe. <laughs> Yes, no, and uh, crazy. A uh, commando in a bathrobe, you know, his bathrobe flops open. And, I mean, if if that happened again, he'd be in Me Too jail. Oh, he'd be <laughs> he'd be arrested he would for be, sure. He would be on planet cancel. He would just <laughs> was he on Milton Berle's level in that respect? Uh, now Milton showed me his dick once at the Friars Club. And, was it uh, all that? It in was the all that. It was everything I could want, but I <laughs> but I wasn't going to get. But I said, but Marilyn Monroe got it, so I felt okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Rodney was in that league, but he never, that was never part of his ticket. With Milton, was always part of his thing. Did you ever realize, let me see if I can rephrase that so it actually makes sense in English. <laughs> Did you ever realize that you were as funny as you thought you were, or as funny as other people thought you were? Or did you have like an inferiority complex regarding how funny you were at any point? Did you like question no, I your own ability? No, I, 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 but you know, I was getting laughs from the time I was a kid, so I knew I could, I could do that. Uh -huh. I had that, but I, I was never consciously aware of it until uh, I got a review. I did a one-man show uh, in the Village, uh, in New York, and the New York Times critic said uh, he's obviously somebody who has been told he's the funniest person in the room. <laughs> and I thought. I said, wow, what cunt brought you for? <laughs> yeah, right. There it is. <laughs> I mean, really? It turns out the guy who writes obituary, and he was like giving, they were giving him a night off. <laughs> so he there's always somebody write, out there who does. Me right there on the spot. Yeah, there's always somebody out there who doesn't actually have a sense of humor. Yeah. That goes and sees something, and then they're the ones who are giving their critique it's like the people who don't like music who are critiquing music, you know, it's, uh, you know, what I was amazed by your wit, Bruce, is that I had no idea that the Oscars worked this way. I don't know if you guys read about this, but Bruce is, and a few writers, they have to be there at the Oscars. Somebody says something or something happens. And in the next five minutes, they've got to write a joke for the next guy to say, commenting on that. Like that's some quick, witty stuff so, that you got to right on the spot. You got to be like, I got to come up with 10 jokes in the next 10 minutes. Well, generally it's for the host. Uh, you, you yeah, know, yeah. Other people you don't want to go off script, especially at the Oscars, uh, because there were so many people watching until this year. But uh, so uh, uh, when uh, generally, I think Billy invented this and David Steinberg, his manager, we, we put together a playbook and we see, we go through the show and we, we place the host where we think he will follow something that will, that will merit a comment. For example, after documentary feature, whoever wins documentary feature is almost certain to make some kind of a political statement. So that's always a good thing. And, uh, and then 
if you if you think certain people are going to win, uh, you play position them there. I mean, but this year they got stuck because they assumed Chadwick Boseman was going to win, and they would get a heartfelt speech from the widow Boseman. But he didn't win. They put it last, and they had to close the show with Joaquin Phoenix saying good night because <laughs> Hopkins wasn't there. Hopkins was in Wales sleeping, and because uh, he thought Chadwick Boseman was going to win. Uh, so you you know you have to engage, and and a lot of that stuff gets thrown away, but it keeps it lively in the show because you know the show it's live, and you want to maintain that the idea of spontaneity in the midst of all of this uh, pomp and circumstance. So uh, that's, that's yeah. And I, I have to say, I, I, I mean, I think it was always the case when Carson was doing it, when Hope was doing it, I think they had their guys, but it didn't get publicized until Billy started doing it. And that was because we won an Emmy for the show that, with Jack Palance doing the push-ups, and, and we rewrote a whole bunch of stuff on the spot. I remember that one. And so yeah, that, was, nobody, that was nobody had brilliant, won, won brilliant writing. Award. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody had run a writing award for the Oscar show before. So suddenly, like, whoa, wow. how about that? Groundbreaking. Yeah, really, in the Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> so if, looking back at your life, what would you say are, I don't know, about five of the things that you're the most proud of? Oh, my God, five. Well, I'm just uh, trying to narrow it down. You know, I don't want to say the I, top one. You know, you know, being like on, ones where you go, this is the, the 25 Oscar about. shows, being yeah. on the ground floor at Bette Midler and following her career for, for five yeah. decades, um, uh, doing Hairspray on Broadway, and doing Hollywood Squares, you know, for six years, which was great fun and uh, made me almost famous. And those would be like uh, up there. And then I guess the fifth thing would be uh, all the various benefits I've done. Uh, I've done a lot of fundraising. We did a lot of fundraising for AIDS when nobody would pay attention to it, when it was a pariah disease, nobody wanted to know about it. And uh, the government was doing nothing. And so we stepped in and started raising money for the various uh, volunteer charities that were working. It was like before or after Rock Hudson? It was before Rock okay. Hudson. Rock Hudson brought it into the mainstream. Right. And Did you work closely with Elizabeth Taylor back then? I did, yeah, I did. I used to joke with her, I said, your key to this because everybody will take your call. Even the Pope will take your call. Yeah. If only to talk about jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> because he's got a lot. And she, she, was, she was selling it. <laughs> <laughs> talk about hats too. So yeah, back, exactly. so you, yeah, I remember when the AIDS epidemic was just full bore and it was just an interesting time growing up in that because it, it changed our culture quite a bit you know and i think that's really what paved the way for um the human rights campaigns to be more successful for people in the homosexual community is because of aids you know and i'm assuming because of the well work that you've done. Uh, absolutely i mean yeah. it, it was a very hedonistic culture until aids happened and we banded together and formed structures that that became political and uh, as a result when the cocktail happened and and the numbers began decreasing those structures then turned their eyes toward marriage equality which was the ultimate goal because that you can't discriminate against people uh, the whole idea of marriage equality was tied to aids because people who'd been in in relationships for years one would get sick and the other was denied access to him because they had no legal basis and that person's decisions were being made for them by a family, which in many cases had thrown them out and was only in it for whatever money they could collect from the, from the estate. So it was important to pass marriage equality so that we would have legal standing in our own relationships. In our, we would have what every other American has as a basic civil right when they get married. And it didn't come from everybody deciding, ooh, let's go to Vera Wang and get bridal gowns. <laughs> it didn't flow from that. It flowed from a genuine civil rights issue. And uh, that's why it, it, it passed ultimately because it was right, because it was, it was the only thing standing in the way of it was, was biblical bigotry. Well, I always thought that that gay people should have had the right to to get married because that's I, that Brendan, he's done. The dog is <laughs> going, going to kill the dog. I thought it was appropriate because um, 
it wasn't right that gays couldn't experience the pain and anguish and suffering of that, divorce that, that, was that all joke. the straight people went through. That it's was, like, was, yeah, was, you guys should have that too. It's it's totally okay for me. That's for what, you, that's you what Ben said. We want, you want to be as miserable as the rest of us? What? <laughs> and actually, this goes back quite a ways. I was doing a, a benefit, an AIDS benefit, and one of the underwriters, there was an airline called Reno Air, which flew out of Reno, Nevada, and uh, eventually got sucked up by American Airlines. But Reno and they Air just flew to Reno? They just flew, flew from Reno to Reno? Reno, yeah, and they flew all over. Uh, okay. they, uh, Alaska picked up a lot of the routes. They, they expanded beyond. But the head of it came down uh, to be on this benefit, to be on stage. And I said, he said, I said, why are you supporting this? This It was also, it was for marriage equality, that, it, beyond AIDS. I said, why, why are you guys so interested in supporting marriage equality? He said, Reno is the marriage capital of the world. And you know, after there is gay marriage, there will be gay divorce. We are also <laughs> the divorce capital. Of the world. Get it on both it's ends. It's a win-win. Yeah. So are you currently married or are you like an affirmed bachelor no, for, for life? Yeah, it looks that way. I mean, I, I was in one relationship 100 years ago. And then there's been lots of uh, attempts, lots of false starts, a lot of fun. But uh, no. It's me and the pug. <laughs> that, well, that should be the name of your. Pug. That's the name of your memoir, "Me and the Pug." Oh, it sounds like something one of the Gabor sisters would write. <laughs> but aren't that's, you? That's you're in, but you're in that. You're in that league now with one, one of the Gabor sisters. I, I certainly am. I'm blonder than they are. <laughs> you're like a Barbie. Less of an I, less of an accent though. Here's a little flat today. I, I got to blow her out. I was going to say something, but I was trying to be polite. I thought you were going to say that's what she said after he said that. <laughs> what? Getting into office humor. Anyway, I well, <laughs> I, I think that we've uh, we've exhausted um, our... Our quibbling, sparring, our, bickering. Well, I don't know. We could we could do it. We could get into something more hardcore if we no, want. Brendan's been extraordinarily now. quiet. Oh, now, see, now he's got to leave. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to thank Bruce Valanche very, very much for coming on tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. We really appreciate it. We could have talked for hours and hours, literally, if you we were did. Good. <laughs> well, At least an hour and 20, anyway. But uh, And uh, because you have so much wisdom to offer, and, and of course, your stories are just, you know, nobody else has them, you know. So that's how they all do. <laughs> they're typing away, they're taping, they're typing. No, but Brendan no, had, before they do. Brendan had a request to see if he could possibly get Whoopi Goldberg to uh, show up on the uh, podcast at some point. So um, I don't know if that's uh, something you would ever inflict upon. Uh, I Whoopi. don't know that she. Yeah, you know, she only I think does things for her like for friends. I mean, I know she's been on some podcasts, but you know, she's on the View every day. Yes. Yeah. And, and she, I want Ted dancing she's to got be her, on she's got her weed business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is she in the weed business? She's in the weed. Oh, I've been in the weed business for a few years. Yeah, she. Oh, got I didn't know that. She doesn't make too much of it, but she she you know promotes it a little bit. But but she's been in it for years. And then you know she when when she's on the view, she's acting. She did that Stephen King thing where her hair is white. It's called The Stand. <laughs> on Paramount. Oh, you're talking about the TV show. I thought you meant On the View. <laughs> oh no, not On the View. Well, she plugged On the View, but but no. She took. She uh, it was shot so that she could do as much of the view as, as she could stand. <laughs> That's funny. Not really her uh, her bailiwick being on the view. Oh, she, I think she loves it. She just gets to express her opinion every day, and uh, but I think she had probably had more fun when they were going into the studio. I mean, they'll probably not do that again until the fall. Actually, go back in with the real audience. All right. Uh, but uh, you know, it's just like I mean. It, it's nice to know that there are, I mean, millions of people tuning in every day to hear what you have to say about something. I mean, you know, not, nobody who's on television is on television, was dragged kicking and screaming on the television. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How dare you make me famous? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I did have a question about that all, almost famous comment. You are famous. How can you say that you're not? You're not necessarily oh. like Will Smith famous, but still, you know, you're. Yeah. No, that's that's true. Or even Jada Smith, Jada Pinkett. <laughs> uh, because I was, I did while I was doing Hollywood Squares, I did a show called Almost Famous, and and Cameron Crowe took that title and uh, 
and use it for a movie and has been apologizing to me ever since. And now he's written the musical of it, which they're gonna bring in in the fall of Almost Famous. But uh, so it was like, and I had a t-shirt and it was like, you know, because it was, I, I had that, I had that kind of fame that I'll be in an airport and people would be coming, would taking selfies and I, from behind them, people walking going, who's he? <laughs> <laughs> and that I don't think happens to Justin Bieber. I mean, I think they know who he is. <laughs> right. They kind of get the vibe. I mean, I'm sure there are one or two who don't, but. Well, you know, you're the first guest we've had in a Oh, roughly a year where, no, I'm sorry, seven months where I was like, I actually know who this is for oh once. <laughs> I, I grew up. Hey, hey. I grew up. I grew up knowing who you were on Obey talk shows and stuff. Big. I know. It's I. You know, I watched. I felt that. I mean, when when people come up to me and say, "Oh yes, I watched Hollywood Squares with my mother or my grandmother," <laughs> yeah, and I'm feeling it as a coach. <laughs> As the decades pass, so yeah. Bruce Valanche turns. I, I'm happy to be. I, I'm happy to be an icon. I love being a gay icon, and I love when these gay guys get to be and say, "Well, I watch you on TV, and I thought if he can be out, I can be out." Which I know is only a backhanded compliment, but yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. It's like it's not like you're losing leading man roles right. from your sexuality. No, I'm not exactly right. I'm not knocking Ryan Gosling aside. <laughs> Yeah. But if you had the opportunity, maybe you would. Uh, you know, I know him, and I keep telling him he offers on the table. But... <laughs> it's it's <laughs> usually like for those movies, it's either a toss up between you and Ryan Gosling. Uh, generally, yeah, yeah, sure. I can see that. I, I find that's the case, or Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> you know, or well, you did uh, steal a role from Arnold Schwarzenegger, didn't you? Did I? You did stole I stole a role from Arnold Schwarzenegger? Well, you didn't steal it, but you played Arnold Schwarzenegger in a movie? Or a oh, I did on the Eric Andre show. Yes. I did the uh, Eric Andre when he, early on in his career when he had that show on Adult Swim. Yeah. Uh, like for 10 minutes, I came on as Arnold Schwarzenegger on a bike. <laughs> and that was the real Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, so you just guy. came in and said, hello, I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger with yeah, no we accent. Had, we had, I had an agent who... Um, liked to find people uh, and uh, he found Sasha Baron Cohen and he made him Ali G and got him that deal and then he found Eric Andre and got him that deal and, and then uh, and Hannibal Buress was the um, was like the Andy Richter he was the sidekick the sidekick yeah and that's where Hannibal did the famously dropped the the dime on Bill Cosby on the show that began the build to, to mm -hmm. what he used today so uh, that I was and I was very happy to be a part of all that. That was great. But That's yeah, a great show. I worked with Arnold, and, and so so basically, you guys kicked off the Me Too movement. So to what to be? So you, you kind of kicked off the Me Too movement with the whole Bill Cosby me. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, get they, get Bruce was made about me twenty years ago, and Harvey Weinstein produced it, and never laid a hand on me. That son of a bitch. <laughs> Hashtag why not me. God damn him. <laughs> it's a new movement, the why not me movement. Why not me? Why, why not me too? Me? So I've been in it from the beginning. <laughs> up there. Well, on that note, which is a great note, yeah. I want to thank Bruce yeah. Lynch very much once again for being thank here you. on the Loves as a Quibble great Squabble. Time. Thank you and so much, Bruce. Uh -huh. Bicker. And you've left the offices of Quibble, Squabble, and Bicker. It's over. It's over. It's time for you to go home. It's over. It's over. Go away now.